what does it mean to interpret the Bible in different contexts, in different cultural situations? Well, this may sound like an abstract question, but we come across it all the time. I remember a time in a small group Bible study where we're sitting around talking about a passage and one person says, oh, this is really what this passage means. And then another person says, oh, but this is what it means to me. And then a third person says, this is what it means to me. Well, how are we to think through these differences? Are these differences always bad? In some ways, do, do we have to um, resolve them? Um, as we think through this question, we need to remember that the general context for interpreting scripture as Christians and as Reformed Christians is in community. We do it with one another. And interpreting with one another can provide checks and balances and can actually help us see areas that are currently our blind spots. I might give an example here of something that I've discovered in my own teaching. I've spent a couple years teaching in Ethiopia and then over a decade teaching in the United States. And one of the topics that comes up is biblical laws about the diet, uh, dietary laws, you know, eat this, don't eat that. How are we to make sense of these Old Testament dietary laws? In the United States, this question comes up and people think, well, maybe these are actually hidden laws about what foods are healthy and what foods are unhealthy, or, you know, there's some other reason for this. But in Ethiopia, each tribe in Ethiopia has different dietary laws and practices that make each tribe distinctive. So they don't eat certain foods and do eat certain foods, and that shows that they are part of this tribe and not another tribe. It has to do with belonging, has to do with their identity as a people. Well, it was in that Ethiopian context, I think, that we can learn something about scripture that we would miss otherwise, which is that in the Old Testament, God gives laws, including dietary laws, not because they're some secret health codes, um, but because he wants his people to be distinct from the other nations. And we can learn from other cultures around the world um, and see our own cultural blind spots as we read scripture together. And so I want to explore in this section how reading scripture together in different cultural contexts can both lead to gifts where we learn from one another, like as we learn from Ethiopian Christians, but there are also times when we need to allow our own culture to be critiqued by the Spirit as we read scripture, since we are reading scripture as ones who are being transformed into the image of Christ. And all cultures in the world have idolatries. We all have values that resist this transformation into the image of Christ. So we've got to hold these two together. That on the one hand, the Spirit works in all different cultural contexts through the Word of God. Um, and the Word of God confronts all different cultural contexts through the Spirit as well. As we think this through, I want to point to Acts in chapter 2 and the famous event of Pentecost. Now, I think there's something going on here that we don't usually recognize, and that is that there are people of different languages and cultures who hear the Word of God through this amazing, miraculous event. So reading from chapter 2, verse 5, now there were, staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, the crowd came together and bewildered it, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these that are speaking Galileans? 
then how is it that each one of us hears them in our own native language? And Acts tells us that not only are they hearing in their own native language, they are hearing about the wonders of God in their own tongues. Now this is something that the Spirit does. The Spirit comes upon people and speaks in all different languages at Pentecost. But there's something subtle going on here. Different languages have different views of culture within them. So if you know Spanish and English, you know that there are certain words that you can't exactly translate between the two. <laughs> if you know various different languages, you know there's sometimes a better way to say something in one language than another. But the Spirit actually comes on people and takes up this process of translating the gospel, translating the good news into all different languages, even though it will result in differences. A central confession of Jews and Gentiles within the book of Acts is that Jesus is Lord. But even in this case, there are different cultural conceptions of what this central confession would mean. For Jews, when they thought of the Lord, that Jesus is the Lord, they thought of the Lord of the universe in the Old Testament who created and chose them as the people. And so Jesus is the Lord. For the Gentiles, that same word in Greek was used to speak about the Caesars, the worldly rulers who would often ask for homage and would be ruling around them. And somehow, in his mysterious way, Jesus was the true Lord now. Jesus is Lord. And so even within the book of Acts in the early church, there are different cultural conceptions that complement each other. And the amazing thing about Pentecost is that it's actually attributing these differences to the Holy Spirit. And it gives us a certain boldness in translating the Bible into different languages, even though there will be different cultural understandings of the Bible. So for example, um, some RCA missions right now are involved in audio scripture ministries, which translates the Bible into the heart language of different people around the world. And that will, that not only translates, but it ends up with different cultural conceptions um, of those passages of scripture. But because of the Spirit's work at Pentecost, we can have confidence that even when there are differences in, in interpretation, um, that those can be spirit-inspired differences um, because God is speaking his word to people of all cultures around the world. On the other hand, there are limits to the differences of this interpretation. Um, Paul speaks about the spirit's work in terms of the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, kindness. It's not possible, in Paul's view, for a culture to say, well, love is not fashionable, kindness is not fashionable in our culture, so we're just going to reject that part. Like, um, you know, we, we want our own cultural view, which is um, hostility and retribution, and we'll do that instead of love, joy, and peace. No, that is outside the limit of what the Spirit is doing. The Spirit is conforming people to Jesus Christ. The Spirit has a definite work, and so there is a range to the Spirit's work. Even as um, it has a specificity to it as well. So when we come to Scripture, on the one hand we come with trust that the living Christ is speaking through scripture, as we come together as communities, as we worship 
that Christ is still speaking through his word. But we also should come with suspicion of our own cultural tendencies to manipulate and control scripture for our own sinful purposes. The kingdom is among us in Christ, but until there is a consummation of Christ's kingdom with the second coming, his disciples will continue to struggle with sin. And all of us as biblical interpreters will continue to struggle with sin. None of us come from a culture that perfectly reflects the identity of Christ that scripture sets forth for us. None of us naturally reflects the mind of Christ, which Paul says that we should seek to grow into. That's why we need to come together and learn from God's word, hear God's word in a way in which we are not in control and where we allow Christ's Lordship to call into question some of our own cherished cultural values um, so that we can grow in conformity with Jesus Christ as followers of him.